Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the SIGAP webinar on case studies of digital banking from emerging markets. My name is Ivo Inik, and I am financial sector specialist at SIGAP. And I'm here today uh, together with Arisha Salman, financial sector, financial sector analyst from SIGAP. What we would like to do in the next hour or so is to walk you through our recent work on digital banking and financial inclusion. We would like to give you first an overall introduction of the context in which we've been running uh, this work and the case studies. And then we will talk about the case studies in general, uh, after which we'll focus more on what are the digital banks in our case studies doing to help advance financial inclusion, how they do it. Uh, we will talk about their business models, and we will also spend some time talking about the enabling factors that we've observed across different markets. After that, which is really after an hour, we would like to also open the floor for uh, questions and, and answers. And we'll spend around 15 minutes on that. A couple of logistics. You will have a chance to post questions throughout the webinar, and please do so. We will be collecting those questions and we'll try to answer them. Uh, at the Q&A session, just to make sure that everybody can see the questions, uh, please select um, in the chat function responding to everyone. And also please note that your microphone will remain muted throughout the webinar, so we'll be only using the Q&A uh, or chat function. The last point is that the webinar will be recorded and shared, and so will be the presentation. So let's start with the overall introduction, setting the background for the case studies. We see that financial inclusion has been advancing quite significantly over the past decade, and digital technology and digital financial services have been playing a key role in helping to achieve that. Between 2011 and 2016, over 1 billion adults have been added uh, or have access former financial services. And digital technology and digital financial services have really played a key role in that. In 2016, over 50% of adult population made or received digital payments, and more than 4% of, of adult population did have uh, a mobile money account. But while the financial inclusion in terms of access is expanding, we see that it remains shallow. What it means? It means that access to other, other financial services beyond the basic transactional payments services still lags behind. So people uh, don't necessarily improve their access to savings, investments, credit, insurance, and a whole suite of other financial services that could potentially help address their financial needs. Um, this translates into lack of financial depth. And in addition to that, we also see that 1.7 billion adults are still outside of the former financial sector. Now, this can be a tr uh, this can be explained through a multiple factors. Um, first of all, customers do find a limited value proposition in the financial services that they can currently uh, currently access. This is do this doesn't mean that the services they access they don't have a value, but it's rather that they do not cover the variety of financial needs that those customers have. So this means also that the range of financial services and products being offered is, is limited. And finally, we also see certain resistance of financial institutions to change their business models, management culture, and operating procedures, all of which translating into the limited customer engagement and transactional rates. Now, when we look at the supply side, we also see some limitations and challenges. For instance, traditional banks in emerging markets uh, still rely heavily on expensive distribution models based on brick and mortar branches. Their IT systems are very often hard and expensive to maintain, and they struggle to adopt uh, product management practices that are agile, human-centered, and uh, reflect the modern state of technology. Now, you know, to clarify, this is not the case only of banks in emerging and developing countries. This is what we observe across incumbent banks around the world. Now, if we look at the financial inclusion champion mobile money operators, 
they also face certain limitations, some of which stem from their very business model and the regulatory restrictions imposed on them, which prevent them from offering a wider variety of financial services in addition to the payments accounts. It prevents them from um, intermediating customer deposits and thus focuses their revenue model on transactional fees, thus limiting really what, what, what they can do and what they can offer to the customers. So taking these, these into account, we believe that a new generation of fully digital retail banks potentially promises to address some of those limits by reaching underserved clients through alternative distribution channels, but also using technology to onboard customers remotely and, and, and uh, faster and, and cheaper than traditional financial institutions can. And also expanding access to a different kinds of products by using data analytics and expanding eligibility of customers for things like credit and insurance. They're offering products that are tailored to the needs of unserved and underserved customers better. They're transparent and user-friendly. And how do you do it? We will talk about later. They're pricing their products more attractively because of the cost efficiencies they're able to incur due to the modern agile tech stack and, and the operational practices, and they pass those cost savings to customers in terms of affordable and better priced products. And finally, they offer a greater variety of products than existing market providers, uh, which cater to a diverse customer needs. And we'll talk about what it means in practical terms and how the studied firms do it in, in our presentation. In our early work, we've identified three promising business models in digital banking that we believe may uh, help to advance financial inclusion. The first of them is fully digital retail bank, and this is the model that we will focus on today. Fully digital retail bank is effectively the traditional bank banking business model, but with improved operational uh, model and, and, and improved um, way of doing things using the cutting edge modern technology. The representatives in our case studies all reflect this fully digital retail bank business model. Then we found a marketplace bank, which is basically a bank in response to e-commerce and fintech competitors in form of creating a one-stop shop for financial services that is run and created by a bank. You can think about it as a grocery store of financial services that is established and run by, by a licensed bank. And finally, banking as a service, a combination of tech, tech capabilities and banking license and banking balance sheet that is all packaged in, in one package that is delivered to fintech startups and other non-bank providers who are interested in delivering banking services to their customers. They can be big tech companies, e-commerce platforms, and others. We may cover some of those in, in the later, uh, later stages. So now let's hear from our colleague, Mark Fleming, who uh, used to work as a Chief Technology Officer at Yoma Bank in Myanmar, and who's been working with us on, on, on this project. Uh, let's hear what he thinks about the role of digital banks in serving low-income customers. What the digital banks are doing is they are, they're leveraging technology to improve parts of the customer experience that's been rather painful uh, or frustrating in traditional banks. If we're talking about um, mass market customers in developing markets, you know, what digital banks are doing with remote sign-up, what they're doing with digital credit, what they're doing with remote cash in, cash out, you know, these, these are solving problems that have been very painful for low-income customers in developing markets. So a digital bank starts with, you know, a, a modern tech stack uh, that's essentially a microservice-based tech stack, usually uh, largely some part or some part of it cloud-based. It, it enables the digital bank, it gives them a level of flexibility that gives the product teams way more control over the product and ultimately be, being able to create a better customer experience these digital banks are able to create a very customer-focused product culture so that it is really the commercial side of the bank that drives the business and it drives the business towards the customers. The biggest unknown for digital banks is that the tech spend uh, has, has been hard to control. Can they build 
this technology platform, you know, with, you know, for a price that doesn't encumber the bank? And does it leave the bank with an operating cost ratio that gives it enough of an advantage and, and give it an ability to scale? We will hear from other experts throughout this presentation as well, but now let me pass the microphone to Arisha Salman, who will walk us through the case studies overview. Thanks, Ivo. Um, so in this section, we'll um, be giving an overview of uh, the three banks, uh, the fully, the three fully dig digital retail banks that we've um, developed case studies for. Uh, one is in South Africa, one is in India, and one is in the Philippines. Um, and these stories are pretty different because each of these banks uh, represents a unique uh, value proposition. Uh, so let's start with Time Bank. Even if we could, so, yeah, thanks. Now, uh, Time Bank is based in South Africa. Um, it started operations in early 2019, um, and uh, it has a unique uh, digital model, uh, which also combines physical touch points. Uh, the physical touch points aren't bank branches, uh, but they're kiosks that are located in about 800 uh, retail stores spread across the country. Uh, customers through these kiosks are onboarded within five minutes. Um, at a cost of about $3 per customer. Within two years, uh, Time Brand has uh, rapidly scaled um, and it's added about 2 million customers uh, with over 100,000 added each month. Um, looking at the demographics, Evo, uh, if we could put this on. Thanks. Now, Time Brand caters to a young customer base spread across rural and urban South Africa. Um, and the gender split of its customers is uh, pretty even. Uh, in terms of activity rates, uh, the, the, the activity rates in comparison to, to other startup banks um, are pretty high. Uh, it's about 50%. Um, and uh, the transactions, the number of transactions that users are performing each month uh, has been steadily growing for Time Bank uh, since its inception. Um, and it's under about eight per month uh, currently. Uh, let's look at the next bank. The next bank is um, Kodak Mahindra Bank. Um, and we've uh, studied uh, the fully digital retail offering of the bank, um, which is Kodak 811. Uh, in terms of uh, size, Kodak Mahindra Bank is uh, India's second largest uh, private sector bank by uh, market capitalization. Um, in the middle of 2017, uh, it launched this fully digital retail solution. Um, and uh, within 18 months of the launch of this solution, um, as a whole, uh, Kodak Mahindra Bank was able to double its customer base. Uh, and it went from 8 to 16 million customers. Uh, Kodak Mahindra Bank offers uh, simple and affordable products. Um, and the key value proposition um, is a real-time onboarding of customers through a video-based uh, KYC, which means that a customer never has to walk into a bank branch um, and gets a fully functional, uh, no limitations account uh, through the video-based KYC process. Um, Kodak Mahindra Bank has uh, been um, running a pretty prominent marketing campaign. Uh, and uh, this campaign features uh, prominent Indian celebrities uh, from the film industry as well as sports players. Uh, and the campaign has been pretty effective in bringing uh, more customers onto uh, Kodak 811. And finally, coming to, um, sorry, Kodak, uh, in terms of the customer base, uh, it again caters to a very um, young customer base. Um, most of them are. Uh, first-time bankers, um, and a lot of them belong to uh, underserved segments. Uh, in fact, a large proportion of uh, Kodak 811's customers belong to the lower segments of uh, India's middle-class population. Uh, in terms of the gender divide, uh, the customer base is primarily male, uh, and uh, the proportion of female customers is actually much higher for uh, Kodak Mahindra's bank, ba bank based uh, channels, uh, which could be because India does have a stark uh, gender based digital divide, and this could be representative of that. Uh, and finally, coming to um, 
our last player, which is Union Bank. Uh, now, Union Bank uh, is an incumbent bank uh, in the Philippines. It's been around for about uh, 50 years. Um, and uh, what really makes it stand out is its focus over the last uh, five years or so uh, on transforming its uh, digital strategy. Um, one element of that is through offering uh, digital financial services. Uh, and the other element is uh, by creating a, a unique e-commerce uh, based platform for MSMEs. Uh, in addition to its own digital offerings, uh, it's also launched um, a banking as a service offering as well as a marketplace bank solution, and we'll come to those. Um, and uh, the last thing to highlight is its focus on uh, rural customers. Um, it's really been uh, pushing its rural agenda, um, and we'll have someone from Union Bank explain how it's doing that. Uh, Union Bank has a four pillar uh, digital transformation strategy, uh, which allows it to serve uh, different market segments. A lot of them are underserved segments. Um, strategy A focuses on um, the digitization of Union Bank's offerings. Um, and uh, the second is uh, a limitation or, or its or its intentional uh, or, it, or, or its intention to limit its uh, bank uh, branch base. Uh, by creating digital banks. Um, the second strategy uh, is launching a fintech um, as well as incubation arm uh, through which it experiments new technologies, um, and that is UBX. Uh, the third strategy uh, is the digitization of a large rural bank um, in the Philippines, uh, which is City Savings Bank, um, and that allows it to cater to uh, rural customers. Um, and the last strategy is its futuristic strategy through which um, it sees itself operating as a digital only bank um, eventually. Next slide, please. Amy. Now, Union Bank uh, is focused on underserved segments. Uh, it plans to reach uh, 65 million customers either directly or by partnering with other institutions. Um, as well as launching uh, different fintech offerings. Uh, 65 million is actually the adult population of the Philippines. Uh, so it, uh, Union Bank is very much focused on uh, tapping the entire market, uh, either directly or indirectly. Um, customers, uh, as you can see, 60% of them belong to underserved segments, um, and 15, 50% are outside urban areas. Um, it reaches customers outside urban areas uh, through a number of initiatives, um, UBX being uh, one of them, um, and we will we will speak a lot about that. Um, but before that, we have a short clipping uh, from Anna Delgado, uh, who is the Chief Digital Officer of Union Bank, uh, and she'll speak more about uh, the rural strategy of the bank. UBX's first product um, or service or platform, actually, that it built is called Eye to Eye, which stands for Island to Island, Individual to Individual. And what it does is it pr provides a platform for rural banks to be able to process uh, fund transfers and other types of transactions um, across the country uh, to different rural banks, to different entities, remittance companies and the like. Um, in near real time, right, if not real time. And it makes it possible now for a rural bank that's on the platform to transfer to any other rural bank or other uh, remittance company um, or institution that signed up to the platform, um, breaking down that uh, structure of having intermediaries so they, can, they transfer to each other directly. And so that also cuts down the cost of transferring and increases the speed of the transfer across the country, right? So this really allows individuals to connect to each other and, and um, <clears throat> send funds to each other much more easily and at a lower cost.
Okay, so thank you, Arisha. And let me now focus on accelerating financial inclusion through the new digital banks. In other words, what digital banks are doing to help advance financial inclusion and serve uh, poor customers. And thanks for sending questions to the chat function. Uh, these are great questions. We'll, we'll get to them in the Q&A part of our presentation, but please keep sending them because uh, all of them are very, very, uh, very interesting. So uh, to really understand the financial inclusion aspect of digital banking, we have developed um, a sort of a framework, assessment framework that looks at four aspects that we consider key in addressing the underserved and excluded customer segments. How digital banks go about cost of their products, how they go about improving access to their products, how they go about tailoring products that are a good fit for poor customers, and then how they ensure that customer experience is, is great. And so when we look at the cost, it's really about passing the cost savings coming from the modern technology and, and modern uh, manage, management processes to customer to make products more accessible and more affordable. The access is a lot about creating uh, alternative distribution channels, innovative distribution models, remote customer onboarding, but also expanding um, eligibility for certain types of products such as credit. Uh, FIT is about improving understanding of customer data, really understanding who customers are and what they need and reflecting that in the product design. And finally, experience is about creating products that are essential, that are simple to navigate, that are easy to, uh, easy to understand and implement in, in daily lives. And I'd like to start with the last part, experience and uh, the concept of essential products and simplicity. So here we really see that simplicity is driving many of the digital bank's products. And uh, this is very important because it also helps to stimulate the uptake and, and usage of those products. And it's only possible due to the data analytics, the level of understanding of those customer segments by digital banks, but also the agile process that we will hear a lot about throughout this presentation that allows banks to, uh, digital banks to launch a minimal viable product engage with customers, collect a feedback about the usage of the product, and then iterate that product frequently until it's, per it's, it's, it's perfect, or at least until the uptake increases to the expected levels. So let me, let's, let's uh, hear from Cohen Yonker, who is a co-founder of TimeBank, about this notion of simplicity and what it means uh, in, in the context of digital banking. when it comes to designing financial products, uh, simplicity is everything. Um, and in our business, we completely obsessed with a minimalist uh, approach to design. As an example, you will see on a typical um, benchmarking, account opening uh, for customers uh, taking somewhere between 25 and uh, 100 clicks. We open a bank account in 15 clicks. And what I would say, if anything, we've learned that even when we think what we've done is simple enough, it's not really simple enough. And if you build subtlety in your proposition or complexity in your proposition that you think you can explain to people, uh, you're probably already in a space that is overcomplicated. The perfect digital banking platform essentially um, also is a teaching platform whereby using a product Customers can self-discover more and more complex features and can actually mature through learning, through just sort of learning as they're ready to learn the new thing. All right, so we'll, we will hear about this uh, a little more, but now let's focus on what are the essential, some of the essential products that uh, digital banks are offering. And we basically see that they are all building their anchor products around three key financial needs. The needs to transfer money and pay, the need to save money, and the needs to borrow. So not surprisingly, all the digital banks that we've studied do have a product offering built around those three needs. So here, let's have a look at the Kotak 11, for example, which has an anchor product called 811 Zero Balance Savings Account. It is effectively what it is. It's a zero, zero balance savings account that can be also used as a transactional account and that offers um, 
appealing interest yield for the customers. If customers need more than just deposit, saving, and, and, and payment function, then they're ch channeled into the main uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank uh, product lines. The next area I'd like to focus on is improved understanding of customers through data. I've already talked about it a little bit, but I, I think this is really important point to emphasize. All the digital banks that we studied do focus on increased capability to collect information about customers and use it in a meaningful way in the business intelligence and, and product design. Um, they they uh, very much uh, rely on the minimum viable product concept where they are able to launch a product, see the customer engagement, get the customer feedback directly or indirectly through the data, and then improve the, the product over the time. Just to give you an example, Time Bank is able to release around 40 updates every week that help them to constantly improve their product. And a similar would be true for the other uh, banks that we studied. But obviously one challenge here is that the newly included customers not always necessarily have a tremendous amount of data that is available uh, about them. And so some of the banks that we've studied are helping uh, to improve the customer data trails in different ways. Here we have one example of Union Bank, which through multiple initiatives helps customers to increase their visibility, let's say, and collect more data about them that then allow Union Bank to better serve those customers. So here are some of the initiatives, not all of which, by the way, are focused necessarily primarily on financial services. Global Linker is a global platform that allows micro entrepreneurs and small and medium enterprises to connect um, to suppliers and customers in different countries. It effectively allows uh, MSMEs to expand internationally. And currently there are 270,000 MSMEs operating on this Global Linker e-commerce platform. The other initiative is Bucks, which is a merchant payment solution leveraging Facebook uh, as a platform. Uh, it's worth noting that in the Philippines, Facebook is really a very popular social media. And so currently there are 30,000 MSMEs using this merchant payment solution, which allows them again to accept digital payments and operate in the e-commerce space. Another initiative is Accentra, which is a B2B solution for what we would call e-formalization, or in other words, it, hel it helps uh, MSMEs to build their e-commerce store and again, participate in the digital economy and digitize their own business. And final initiative here worth mentioning is CCAP, which is uh, a marketplace for lending or marketplace for loans, again, serving primarily MSMEs and connecting MSME customers with loan providers, not only the, the union bank itself, but also other uh, loan providers. And so through these initiatives, uh, through these initiatives, Union Bank is helping to increase digital data trails of their customers that they are then able to use to, to better serve them. So let's hear from Ana Delgado again about how they go about this creating customer data trails. We're able to capture data relevant to assessing credit in a different way, right? So if in the past we were relying on formal documentation, uh, once we digitize banking for these sectors, and that allows us to form a picture about them, and that allows us therefore to lend against this picture. And as we will see later, it's not only about lending, but it's also about really understanding how the customers behave and what what other financial needs they have or non-financial needs they have that they can be addressed. The other example of using data analytics to better serve customers is risk-based pricing. And here we have a, an example of time that is planning to launch a customer credit that will be using alternative data to underwrite uh, consumer loans. Time, and we'll hear about it in, in, uh, in detail later, has created a unique distribution model that uses a partnership with uh, pick and pay and boxer retail stores. And that also allows uh, potentially time to see the basket level information about their customer transactions. So not only the generic transaction data, but also what exactly customers are, are buying in those stores. 
uh, Time is also able to track the usage of smartphone by their customers and collect data about that. And they've created algorithm that allows time to underwrite loans based on this alternative data. Now, we should emphasize that uh, customers, once the product is lined, will be able to choose whether they want to uh, use this option. In other words, whether they want Time Bank to really track this data. Um, but it may be really appealing for customers who do not have a rich credit history and this alternative data underwriting can be really a way for them to access a credit and access a credit at the price that is risk-based, that really reflects their actual risk and not only the lack of credit history or credit information. The next point, which is very important, is innovative distribution models. Digital banks, as much as other banks and financial institutions that are serious about serving excluded customers, do understand that they need to combine physical with digital uh, touch points. And they do it in different ways. Uh, they rely much less on brick and mortar branches and agents, although they still use those channels and they use them in a creative ways. But more often they create blended solutions, combining offline and online solutions, ensuring that customers can get different types of access uh, to products. They're leveraging uh, other partners who do have physical presence, such as rural banks, grocery stores, ATMs, and others. And they also create innovative solutions, such as uh, a kiosks or integration with the till machines at grocery stores, all of which help to improve the access to their products. So it's a really uh, a, a multi-channel strategy that we see emerging that com combines the offline and online experience. Now, one example that already have been alluded to is TimeBank. TimeBank has created this bespoke solution in terms of kiosks. Kiosks are ATM-like machines placed in grocery stores that allows customers to sign up for an account and receive a debit card in less than five minutes for less than $3. And TimeBank is onboarding currently 85% of their customers uh, through those 800 plus retail stores um, which translates into almost 100,000 customers onboarded every month through this channel. The additional 15% are onboarded uh, via website. So let's hear from Cohen again about the distribution through kiosks and how this idea uh, emerged. We were um, thinking very hard about how can we get the best of all worlds. So the best of all worlds is pure digital onboarding, so you need no paper. The second uh, is that it's a self-service channel, so you don't have to train banking staff uh, and have all the compliance issues associated with a bank staff member uh, or an agent having to do the onboarding. The third was how do I do it in a way that doesn't require me to deliver the debit card to the customer at their house and have that logistical problem? The fourth requirement is how do I de-risk the process? How do I actually make sure that the, 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 the risk of syndicate activity and defrauding the customer at the front end uh, you know, is, is reduced? And then the last one is how do I create for the customer a really sleek experience, a very easy experience. And no matter how we, how we looked at these design parameters, the only thing that we could find that gave us the best of all those worlds was this kiosk. And what this new thing now gives us, it gives us low cost, low risk, and highly um, efficient uh, uh, customer onboarding and a great customer experience. Without any paper, in three and a half to five minutes, the customer would open a fully functional bank account. Five minutes later, the customer walks away with a personalized debit card. And we think about it as a high touch, high tech model. Kiosks are actually even more cost effective than the digital channel. And it's a combination of two things. The first is that the cost of digital um, marketing is going up uh, and we can reduce that cost very significantly through marketing inside physical stores. The second is the logistical cost of distributing a debit card. 
And by having this kiosk, we very significantly reduce the cost of, 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 um, of that debit card. And so the variable cost of opening that bank account uh, at uh, the kiosk is in the order of $3 per customer. And uh, the time bank estimates that the cost of running the kiosks is around 40% of what would be the cost of running a branch network. So let's move on and uh, let's look at another example, which is the Union Bank's I2I, which we've already heard about. It's also a way to reach out to customers beyond the traditional uh, distribution models. I2I is an initiative that helps rural banks, and there are 400 of them in the Philippines, to modernize and serve their customers better with perhaps more quality products and also with products that they were not able to serve them with before. So this initiative really allows I2I to serve a larger population of not necessarily direct Union Bank's clients, but clients that they reach out through this uh, initiative in partnership with rural banks. Currently, there are 50 participating rural banks in the network, and the number is growing. So let's hear from Ana Delgado about this concept. When we took a look at the cost to serve the customer in the branch versus digitally, you're looking at 10 uh, times upward, right? Less cost uh, to serve because one is that you're able to scale transactions, um, and we're now able to process, um, you know, incrementally a larger number of transactions at lower cost. You know, when we look at the number of accounts we were able to open digitally this year, um, and we compare that to the number of accounts that were being opened in our branches. We've effectively opened six times, six, excuse me, six years worth of accounts digitally. Um, that we it would have taken us six years to open them in the branches. This year, we decided to expand our physical touch point reach and we signed up with uh, 7 Eleven and now are able to accept deposits from any 7 Eleven branch uh, nationwide. And so that brings in thousands more locations. Uh, we've already uh, beat our transaction expectations for the year. We're, we're, we're actually seeing double what we expected to have for the year. So it really shows you um, that <clears throat> access to banking does not have to be limited by bank branches, right? So here are some, some, some numbers that I, I find very interesting about uh, the transactional and level of engagement. The other area to focus on, which is very common for digital banks, is how do you go about remote onboarding of customers? Uh, to overcome the physical distance, but also to overcome the lack of documentation that many poor people face, digital banks are coming with a new solutions and innovative, uh, innovative approaches, leveraging biometrics, leveraging technology, leveraging uh, a video to onboard customers uh, faster, cheaper, and with the existing pieces of infrastructure. So one example here is Kodak Bank. Uh, Kodak has been working on remote uh, onboarding for quite some time, facing some limitations by the regulation, but they've been able to really make remote onboarding work, although within the regulation, they had to create a, a sort of follow-up physical verification in, in their process. But now, the Reserve Bank of India has allowed video KYC, and Kodak was obviously no late to, to launch their eKYC video process, which basically uh, allows customers to simply use their device, use their existing Aadhaar and, and PIN card numbers, and then dial in, call the Kodak representative, and through video, um, go through the onboarding process, sign the documents uh, remotely, and open the fully functional account. As Arisha mentioned, these are accounts that do not have any limitations. They are not, these are not tiered accounts. This is a full KYC process that happens over the video and is very fast. Another example is Union Bank that's been working with uh, a fintech called Jumio to improve their uh, remote onboarding and eKYC solution. They were able to shorten already short 15 minutes time to uh, onboard customers to five minutes. Uh, and they were also able to reduce the risk of onboarding related fraud 
uh, by around 40 percent. And they've done it by leveraging biometrics, leveraging artificial intelligence and other technological solutions that ensure that customers on the other side of the screen are real customers. Uh, their identity is the real identity and can be can be verified. The third example is a time bank, again, using the, the kiosk based solution and leveraging very similar pieces of technology, biometrics to identify the customers, the connection to the departments of home affairs that collect information about uh, customers identities and using this to identify and verify customers within uh, less than five minutes. The point that I'd like to emphasize for onboarding is that uh, for each of the digital banks that we studied, uh, we see how they are able to accommodate the existing pieces of infrastructure, the existing pieces of identity that they can use. And it's not necessarily that they uh, have to rely on a nationwide coverage, for example, by, by national ID. They really look at what is available, what is available for their target segment, and how they can identify and verify customers remotely, and, and then they implement that solution. The other point that is very important, obviously, and it's the last point I'd like to focus on in this section is attractive pricing and incentives. It's obviously very important for those digital banks serving poor people to price their products so that they are affordable and accessible to their customer segment. And they do it largely by having this philosophy and commitment of passing cost savings incurred through the implementation of technology on customers and, and trying to really stay uh, below the market as we see here in the example of Time Bank, that for the average of 12 transactions is offering uh, products that are 40% less expensive than the, the second cheapest uh, product offering. And we've tried to you know, test it out, uh, and this, this comes from the UBS report, but we also look at the different numbers comparing competitors on the savings account. And uh, we see that Time is really constantly uh, offering better priced products. So now let me pass again microphone to Arisha, who will talk about the business models and sort of financial aspects of those digital banks. Thanks, Evo. Um, let's look at the next slide. So all the digital banks that uh, we've uh, case studied uh, have demonstrated um, an interest um, in becoming uh, profitable and uh, scalable. Uh, and while none of them are currently uh, profitable, they did demonstrate a clear pathway to profitability. Uh, in terms of the revenue streams, uh, the revenue streams uh, mirror that uh, of a traditional bank, uh, with uh, intermediation revenue being the primary uh, stream for digital banks, and, and, and that's a more futuristic view. Um, uh, and by intermediation revenues, we really mean um, the difference between what a digital bank collects on its loans, uh, the interest, and what it pays on uh, deposits. Um, and uh, while uh, these continue to be um, the same for all the banks, um, for digital banks and traditional banks, the size of uh, the revenue sources are pretty small currently for uh, digital banks. Specifically looking at uh, the players we've studied. Um, next slide, please, Evo. Um, all these players are currently in uh, their growth stages. However, they have clearly defined uh, pathways to profitability. Uh, for example, Kotak Mahindra Bank uh, is focused on expanding the size of its pie, that is, attracting more customers uh, onto its balance sheet through Kotak 811. Um, and that's something it's been able to successfully do. Um, and once it has all these customers on board, uh, it focuses on cross selling more premium products uh, so that these customers become profitable for the bank. Um, and customers typically uh, also embark on different pathways. They um, start opting for credit products, for deposit products, and investment products uh, that are offered by Kodak Mahindra Bank. Uh, overall, uh, cross-selling has helped the bank uh, to improve the average revenue per user uh, for the bank as a whole. Uh, looking at our next two players, uh, 
as as we earlier mentioned, Time Bank has onboarded a large percentage of its customers through kiosk based channels and the remaining uh, through digital channels. Um, and uh, the way it looks at sustainability is by driving down costs. Um, the cost of running a kiosk is roughly 4% of that of running a bank branch. Um, however, for revenues, uh, it it does look at credit uh, as uh, the key driver of revenue growth um, at once it launches consumer as well as MSME credit. For Union Bank, uh, its digital transformation strategy is actually right now um, an investment. Uh, it's testing different strategies, for example, the API developer portal, uh, the merchant's payments platform, um, and uh, most of these are offered on a premium basis to customers. Uh, the assumption is uh, that there will be profits from scale once the business grows um, and uh, these services are continued to be monetized. Um, in fact, what's important to note for all these players is uh, that uh, their sustainability very much hinges on um, scale uh, because they see small revenue streams coming from customers at an individual basis. So it's really going to be a scale game uh, for sustainability in the long run. Uh, let's look at the next slide. Uh, now, what gives digital banks an edge over um, this the other huge ecosystem of fintechs um, and non-bank players like neo banks um, is the ability for digital banks uh, to intermediate deposits because they have the license to do so, um, and that allows uh, digital banks to grow their revenues, uh, launch more products, optimize the cost of capital. Um, what's so while intermediation doesn't really impact how a customer interacts with a bank, uh, it does limit the, the or it does provide an edge uh, to digital banks in comparison to neo banks uh, that are only able to earn revenue on through fee largely. Um, moving on to the next slide. However, while the superiority of digital banks is clear. Uh, there are several barriers uh, to um, acquiring a banking license for digital players. Um, and what most new entrants choose to do uh, is to set up non-banks to provide banking services. Uh, we did study another player uh, in Mexico, which is a new bank. Um, it's, it's actually been rapidly growing and acquiring customers. Um, and uh, the key offering is uh, an integrated debit and credit solution. Um, so CLAR largely caters to confile customers and it uses uh, debit uh, card data uh, to offer the first line of credit to um, its, its customers. Um, and about 65% of these customers have never accessed credit before. Um, how is it able to do so? How is it able to offer both debit and credit? Um, if we could look at the next slide. Yeah, so its regu regulatory status does not permit it to intermediate deposits, um, and CLAR has set up two independent companies. Uh, one that's an e-money provider to which it collects deposits. Uh, however, those deposits are not extended as loans, uh, but uh, CLAR provides loans through uh, another company that it's set up, which is a credit provider that has its independent line of credit. Um, and while, again, uh, there is no difference with the way a customer interacts with CLAR, for example, and another digital bank, uh, but uh, in the long run, there are limitations uh, for CLAR's revenue structure. Um, I'll now hand it over to Evo to walk us through the last section on enabling factors for uh, digital banks. Thank you, Arisha. So let's look at what are the enabling factors that allow those digital banks to emerge and thrive in the markets. And we've really observed three factors that seem to be very important. One of them is the regulatory framework. The other one is existing pieces of uh, uh, infrastructure, market infrastructure. And the third one is the technology that is available and used. And let's start with the technology hearing from Ana Delgado about how they think about the technology, what it means and what it does for digital banks. For 
us, technology is an enabler. It is not the end. It is the means to, to deliver an, an end, right? Um, and it, it, we see it as um, allowing us to improve the efficiency of our processes, widening our customer reach, and also enhancing our customer experience, right? And so from a business model standpoint, uh, we think technology allows us to bring down costs or keep them manageable at least while allowing us to scale up further, right? We believe that if you're going to be an institution that uh, harnesses digital, you need to be able to deliver straight through 24-7 Six Sigma reliability processes. And we can't do that if you if you don't understand how each of the systems work with each other and if you don't architect for that kind of uh, service delivery, right? And so our enterprise architecture allowed us to, to design this, the tech stack um, for this kind of service approach. So we adopted an open API strategy to allow us to partner with different fintechs and different companies. Um, and again, this has also been in service of the, uh, both bringing in different types of services to our clients, but also in enabling us to connect to uh, services of fintechs and other companies and offer it to our client base. Um, third, I would say that robotic process automation is an important part of the tech stack as well in any digital transformation um, because you want to automate um, and, and eliminate redundant functions, right? Um, that uh, are not providing any value to the to the process. Data science as a capability, while it's not necessarily uh, a tech stack in itself, um, data science as a practice is is very important for us to be able to leverage um, the data we have in order to enhance our customer engagement. Right? And lastly, but very, very important is uh, we need to have cybersecurity um, and resiliency uh, in your tech stack. So Anna touched upon a couple of points that I would like to just uh, reiterate because we see them also across the other studied firms. First of all, the technological stack or the approach to technology is very much embedded in the concept of modular architecture, which allows banks, digital banks to be flexible and agile and which brings cost efficiency that can be then passed on to the customers. It also allows for scalability, which is very important. And Arisha already talked about the scale as a part of their business model strategy or revenue strategy. But the scalability that is uh, coming from the fact that very uh, many of those solutions are cloud based also allows banks to be responsive to a shocks like the pandemic, for example. We've seen that many of our digital banks have actually increased the number of transactions and customer engagement over the pandemic and the scalability of their model allowed them to respond very quickly. Effective management of data, very important point that allows for agile customer centric product development that we already talked about. And that sort of allows also those companies to implement this, this sort of agile customer centric culture. So uh, here's one example of how time uh, has built their modern tech stack. And you will see that, you know, it really ticks all, all these boxes. So their solutions are cloud-based. They use microservices architecture and containerization approach, which allows them to really test new solutions very quickly to come up with the minimum viable products to iterate their solutions in a live environment using the feedback from customers. They use robust data analytics and they have created a conducive corporate culture that is uh, encouraging innovation and that is leveraging a different types of technical expertise uh, across their, their uh, technological team. Regulation is obviously another very important enabling factor. We see that globally regulators are adopting different approaches to encourage new entrants and new digital banks to reach the market and increase the competition. Many of you have heard about countries, especially in Asia, coming up with bespoke digital banking license that um, allows banks to be licensed as a digital banks. But we also see countries that do not implement a specific bespoke license, but they implement an open approach to new types of business models and solutions. And we see those countries are thriving uh, when it comes to digital banking. 
And then we also see countries that combine different approaches, including the phased approach, which allows digital banks or newcomers to launch their uh, business. And as they grow with a minimum, minimum license and some restrictions on what they can do, and as they grow their capabilities and, and capital readiness, they finally extend their license to the fully full-fledged uh, banking license. So here are some examples. Um, I know there's probably a lot of interest in those bespoke digital banking licenses. Uh, we studied those regimes and we found that many of them basically impose very similar requirements on digital banks as they impose on traditional banks. The difference is usually about restrictions on the physical presence of digital banks who might be that might be restricted from running a branch-based model, the focus on financial inclusion, uh, making sure that those players are serving excluded and underserved uh, customers. But overall, we kind of came to conclusion that uh, a bespoke licensing regime for digital banks is probably not necessary to really incentivize digital banks to operate in the market. So now let's hear from Cohen about his views on enabling regulation. I think the first is we're looking for regulators who have progressive risk-based rather than rule-based approach to regulation. The second thing we're looking for is regulators who are open to cloud-based solutions. And um, we have walked away from very interesting opportunities in countries because the regulators were not willing to accept cloud. Uh, I do believe that um, uh, regulators who are willing to accept cloud will have their industry stuck in uh, high cost models uh, that will take a long time to unwind. Third thing I'll emphasize with regulators is a regulation around KYC customer onboarding uh, and um, the a willingness to, to uh, allow for some experimentation in that, in that regard. I do believe that technology allows us uh, a lot more power and flexibility. It allows us to create solutions that are much better than the old generation KYC solutions. So here are some, some uh, perspective on the regulation. And the final point I'd like to cover is the infrastructure. So. The critical pieces of infrastructure that we consider enabling is high internet penetration and growing smartphone adoption. I would say these are really essential prerequisites for digital banks to thrive in the long term. And then useful enabling factors are national ID coverage and robust payment systems. But as mentioned before, the national ID is not the necessary condition. It's just something that makes life of uh, digital banks easier. But we see that they are creative in coming up with solutions that allow for identification and verification of customers without the national ID coverage. And for the robust payment systems, again, it's a useful enabling factor, especially for instant payments. But again, we see how banks were able to create their own solutions to promote instant payments, such as the I2I solution by the Union Bank. So we have reached the end of our presentation and I would like to now open the Q&A session and have a look at some of the questions that you submitted. Thanks a lot for, for, for them. Um, my colleague, Arisha, she's been uh, trying to answer some of those questions um, throughout the presentation. So I believe that many of them have been covered, but maybe over to you, Arisha. Um, maybe pick first question and, and uh, cover it. Sure. So um, one of the questions that I haven't covered is on the regulatory and policy must haves for banks to operate. What needs to be in place? Um, we covered that, but how do we convince central banks? There's, there's a question in that. So it'll be interesting to take that up. Yeah, this is obviously a very important question. And um, we covered that regulatory aspect very, aspects very briefly. I think the central banks are increasingly under pressure to improve competition in their markets. The banking sector is very concentrated across the world, and I think there is an increasing pressure to change that dynamic. Risha, may I ask you to mute, please? And so, so um, 
how to convince the, the central banks. It really takes some time, but uh, based on our experience and what we've seen speaking to actually regulators about the digital banks, what is really the convincing factor beyond that broader policy objective of improving uh, competition is showing them that the new players are delivering safe, valuable banking products that do not harm the customers, that do not harm the market, that even though they're using a new ways of doing things, cloud-based core banking systems, biometrics enable onboarding, alternative distribution through retail stores or otherwise, these are resilient solutions that meet the banking standards and the banking regulation. And that's what seems to be seems to be helping convince regu regulators. Now, you definitely need to have regulators who have an open mind and who are able to look at things from different angle uh, and try to understand how those new solutions are still complying with the existing legal frameworks or change the legal frameworks if needed. I mentioned the example of the Reserve Bank of India that has allowed uh, everyone, frankly, to onboard customers to video. And we will hopefully see more of these changes reflecting the advancement in technology. Some regulators are being assisted by what we call innovation facilitators, such as, for example, regulatory sandboxes. Uh, but uh, going back to the point of bespoke licensing regime, um, it's gaining traction in certain regions, but in the studied firms, in the studied jurisdictions, in our case studies, only one, and this Philippines, is considering a bespoke digital, a digital banking license. The other countries are, you know, welcoming digital banks to their markets without having a bespoke uh, regulatory regime. Thanks, Ivo. Um, there's another question on the limitations and gaps of knowledge products. Uh, that we perceive in the creation and development of digital banks. This is come from Roberto. Um, is yeah. So so I mean that question could be interpreted in different ways. But um, we talked about this uh, with with uh, our players and you know how they go about making sure that customers can navigate very easily through the products and especially this is especially important for customers who for the first time access a form of financial service. Uh, a banking service, and the the concept of simplicity was really something that keep occurring in our conversations. But obviously, this concept of simplicity, uh, you know, might have some limitations. And so, we were curious to understand, you know, whether it means that certain customer segments will only get access to a very basic financial ser services and products. And what we learned from our case study firms is that it's not really about the basic products; it's more about how you can translate even a complex product into a simple, easy to navigate through customer experience. And so what we see with all of these digital banks is that they onboard customers with an anchor product that is easy to understand, easy to use, caters to some of the essential financial needs. But then through the different methods, um, customers mature and graduate to other more complex products as they get more uh, sort of familiar and comfortable with the digital banking platform. And to do that, digital banks use different strategies, including, for example, per, uh, the personal finance management tools, different dashboards, a, a different behavioral based um, concepts that help customers to get really comfortable and use the financial products. So it's not necessarily about uh, only sort of a financial education, financial literacy, but also the customer experience being made very simple and very intuitive. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, there was also uh, something around limitations and gaps or uh, that are perceived. Um, so we did cover most of them, but um, some of the limitations uh, that we did talk about were, um, were and, and that's an important one, is the high capex um, in developing technology, in setting up uh, the kiosks um, and even the remote onboarding infrastructure. Um, so, so that did come out as one of the limitations. Um, and uh, another one was on uh, regulation. So there's still um, no consensus amongst uh, regulators on digital banks and, and uh, the, the, the digital banking license in most countries is still at a very nascent stage. Uh, so uh, these factors are going to uh, play a key role um, in the growth of this ecosystem. And let me just add to that point, uh, Arisha, thanks for thanks for uh, answering that. Um, 
One thing that we've observed is how the CapEx and OPEX is slightly different or sometimes significantly different at digital banks as compared to traditional banks. So for instance, the cloud-based solutions really allow to transform some of the, the, the CapEx categories into OPEX, right? The other thing is that because the, the constant agile product development requires a constant change, including change in technology, we see that digital banks are sort of accounting and, and booking their costs on technology on an ongoing basis, which again is different from what traditional banks would normally do. So we also see a differences in, in that approach as well. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, there's another question and we've, uh, we have spoken a little about uh, the main or the hook products. Uh, but uh, Alex Walker asks what differences we've observed um, in the products that drive uh, customer acquisition. Uh, do key use cases vary a lot by country? Um, we did cover that uh, the hook products continue to be simple, um, the simple products uh, that, that usually consist of uh, transaction accounts or savings accounts uh, that come with a debit card that's linked to these accounts. Uh, but uh, these are only to bring the customers onto the balance sheet. Largely, uh, the banks are looking to cross-sell more premium products uh, that will help them grow their revenue base. Um, uh, and, and we've seen that across the board, across the four countries that we've studied, uh, that the key strategy seems to be simplicity um, and then moving to more sophisticated products. Um, Evo, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think that's uh, that's a very very good answer. Um, I, I see one question here that relates to the pandemic and you know how the pandemic has accelerated the pace in digitization of finance uh, and what are some of the prerequisites to ach achieve digital finance. Which I talked about the enabling factors already, but I'd like to focus on that pandemic part because we're obviously we started this work before the pandemic hit and then. Um, we continued throughout the early stages of the pandemic, and so we were very much in touch with our case study firms, and we saw that all of them reported increase in digital transaction, increase on uh, onboarding, not surprisingly, because they were ready to do it uh, remotely, social distancing, and, and allow customers to uh, engage without going to physical touch points, which obviously was very important. But the point I'd like to emphasize here is that you know, achieving the digital finance or or, or um, achieving the increased rates of uh, poor people using digital finance really depends on how finance blends with their daily lives and how their daily lives blend with where the world is moving towards more digital economy and e-commerce. And from that point of view, I'd like to really again underscore the initiatives that Union Bank has been implementing where there's a lot of effort to help customers, especially micro entrepreneurs and small and medium enterprises to participate in the trend of digitization of commerce and be more part of that, um, that trend and then use financial services in that context. And I think that's very important because it helps to answer the question of what is the financial inclusion even mean to achieve and what it is mean to do for people, for poor people, here we have the answer. It helps them to improve their livelihoods. It, it helps them to um, sort of keep pace with the changing world and the world of e-commerce and, and digital economy. Uh, thanks, Ivo. Uh, then there's one question that would be very relevant to the financial inclusion discussion, uh, which is on uh, how these banks are catering to unbanked people, um, and, and I did throw some light on how um, a large percentage of them are first-time bankers, um, and uh, uh, an even larger percentage of them have never accessed credit through formal channels before. Um, and this is through um, an intentional targeting of first-time bankers for uh, digital banks. Um, but is there anything else we'd like to add, Ivo? I would just use example of time and, and sort of, uh, again, iterate the point that time has built the bank with a purpose to advance financial inclusion. Part of it was also to understand what customers need on daily basis, where customers live and how customers engage with 
uh, in the context that require financial services. So not only asking the question of like, what is the financial services that customers needs, but what are the financial services that uh, can enable what these people are already doing uh, and these customers need to do. And so that's, for example, the partnership with the grocery stores in, in South Africa. And that's, for example, initiatives such as creating a loyalty program that actually builds your loyalty points on the grocery uh, purchases that you make. Uh, time is subsidizing that program, uh, sort of doubling the loyalty point that people then can turn into uh, increased purchases. And this is one example of how digital banks are trying to kind of reflect the context in which um, excluded or underserved customers operate and adjust to that context, not only with the product offering, but overall with the value proposition that they craft. Okay, um, then we have a question on the financial products that are offered in urban and rural areas. Uh, are these products the same? If not, how do they differ? Um, I can take it up and then you can um, uh, jump in, Evo. Uh, so the products that we studied are the same uh, for both urban and rural customers. Essentially, if you take the example of Time Bank, uh, its uh, kiosks are located uh, in both urban and rural South Africa. Um, and there's no difference in the products offered. However, uh, there are uh, players that uh, are focusing on the rural customer by uh, developing special strategies to distribute products to the customers um, in rural areas. For example, Union Bank, uh, it, uh, it, it has acquired City Savings Bank uh, which is its uh, which is now a subsidiary um, uh, catering to uh, rural customers across the Philippines. Um, and uh, while the products offered are uh, pretty standard, uh, it arms uh, City Savings Bank's uh, loan officers with mobile technology to deliver these products um, in uh, remote rural areas. In fact, uh, teachers are a key segment for um, City Savings Banks. Um, and these loan rangers go to the schools where teachers um, take classes um, and use uh, their uh, tablets to sign up these teachers for uh, loan products. Uh, so that's that's one example in how the distribution uh, strategy varies, but the products in itself remain pretty standard across um, across regions. The only point, Arisha, I would add is that we also see that digital banks sometimes recognize that they may not necessarily know very deeply all possible subsegments of their customer target segments. And so there is an increased interest and move towards marketplace strategy where digital banks are creating marketplaces of third party provider products that who, who may know the target customers better. And so they may offer those products. Um, to the very specifically defined customer segments through those created marketplaces. And we've seen it with CCAP, for example, at Union Bank, but it's a strategy that um, that is increasingly emerging. Um, on that point, I'd like to also mention that in this presentation, we mostly focus on fully digital retail banks, but we are uh, continuing our work and we will be exploring in more detail those other two models that I mentioned at the beginning, which is the marketplace banking and marketplace strategy and the banking as a service model. So in some of our later webinars or presentations, we will be covering uh, those as well. Okay, we've, we've covered most of our questions. There's one uh, from Walid on uh, cross-selling. Um, and uh, this was, I, I believe in the context of Union Bank. So. Um, it was on Union Bank's premium model um, and how it plans to cross-sell. We, we did talk about cross-selling for Coda Gate 1-1, uh, but we didn't touch upon it for uh, Union Bank. I would just generally say that there is a concept or pathway to uh, maturity that relies on uh, graduating customers from basic products to sort of more, more products and increasing the, uh, the average return per user over the time. So all of the studied banks do have a strategy of, of upselling and cross-selling customers in the long term as the customers sort of graduate and are able to, uh, or are in need of, of other products. Um, 
they do it in in, in different way. The Union Bank uh, is an interesting case study of doing so also by uh, serving customers uh, through non financial uh, services such as you know helping them to set up the e-commerce platform or helping them to connect to different suppliers or expand internationally but it's a definitely an important component and the, the, the idea of scaling up is a different component of all of the digital bank strategies so i think we uh, have arrived at the end of our presentation um, i'd like to thank all the participants for joining us today and for asking great questions. Uh, obviously, thanks go also to my colleague Arisha for, for joining in the presentation. I would like to invite all of you next week for the another webinar, which this time will focus more on what regulators can do to harness or even promote innovation through regulatory sandbox and other initiatives. We will hear from regulators from Kenya, Morocco, and the Philippines and two international experts about their experience with regulatory sandboxes. So November 10th, please join us if you will. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you.